All right, everyone, thank you so very much for joining us for today's webinar, the second in the Chem Voices series. Uh, so just a very brief introduction on Chem Voices. Uh, it is a partnership between IUPAC and the International Younger Chemists Network. Um, it is all about showcasing the future of chemistry. Uh, and we are starting this series by featuring um, awardees from the periodic table of younger chemists which was actually uh, a project that ran as part of IUPAC 100. And the idea here is that we're really going to be discussing issues that are relevant to early career, early career chemists. Uh, and so we have a lot of great content planned and coming through uh, the pipeline. Uh, we, uh, I would encourage you to go to our website, chemvoices.org. You can get in touch with us, let us know what sort of content you would like us to uh, organized webinars around. Uh, you'll be able to view all of our um, previous webinars as well. Um, it's a really great resource um, for for the for this this demographic and this community. Um, however, it's not just a couple of people who are responsible for putting together uh, such a great program. Uh, we have a phenomenally uh, dedicated and active team of people uh, from both IUPAC and IYCN um, who are here helping us create content and deliver it to you all. So these, these are the uh, task group members who have been uh, working with us uh, over the last five months now to get Chem Voices up and running and, and to get us to where we are today. And so I am going to hand it over to uh, Gabby, who is uh, leading our session today. So thanks very much, Gabby. <laughs> Thank you, Kerry. Welcome, everyone. I would like to begin by thanking you all for coming today. I am Gabriela. I am the host of today's webinar. Today's webinar is Chemists Beyond the Bench, and it is a discussion about alternative career in chemistry. We will highlight the experiences of three early career chemists that are working in areas that are considered as non-traditional or alternative careers in chemistry. We have a list of three excellent speakers, Dr. Natalie Lafranco, Dr. Fernando gomoyon Bell, and Dr. Aubrey Paris, who I will introduce in detail before each individual presentation. The webinar of today is divided into three sections. First, a very short introduction about what is an alternative career in chemistry or the areas that are considered an alternative career in chemistry. Then we will start with individual presentations of our speakers, Natalie, Fernando and Aubrey. And after each presentation, there will be time for a couple of questions. And also if we have time, some more additional minutes at the end for any other questions from the audience. And remember, you can submit your question here in the GoToWebinar platform. We will be collecting all of them for our speakers. And the first is, what is a, a traditional career and what is an, alter, an alternative career? And the first point is, a degree in chemistry opens the door for many career options, even in or out of the lab. lab. But uh, in general, and also for many chemists, what is a traditional career is, for example, a working laboratory, a professor at a university, a researcher working in drug discovery and in, in this, uh, this, uh, developing new kind of technology, and also the chemists that used to work in quality control analysis. However, it has become more and more usual for chemists to get jobs in what is known as alternative careers. And it is also important to notice that uh, having a degree in chemistry gives you a lot of useful skills that allow you to develop a career, even if it is related or not to chemistry, in areas as management consulting, data science, intellectual property, technology, finance. And today we will highlight a career in science communication, science and public policy, and also business and marketing. Another important point is that the careers in these areas are not restricted to just one uh, type of organization. And instead, you can be working, for example, for corporations, for the government, or also for startups. And for knowing more about these careers and these type of options for 
Alchemist. Natalie is our first speaker. She did her PhD in chemistry at Washington University in San Luis. She's currently the vice president of market development at Cofactor Genomics. And Natalie has combined her knowledge in chemical biology with business and leadership skills. She also has, uh, has held numerous roles in the American Chemical Society, and she is currently sharing the diversity, inclusion, and respect advisory board. And she is also a career consultant. So welcome, Natalie. Thank you, Gabby. Let me get my screen up here so you can see my slides. All right. Excellent. Well, thank you again, Gabby, for the kind introduction and many thanks to the team at IYCN, uh, of course, with the support of IUPAC for the opportunity to participate in this webinar series. It's incredibly inspiring to see all of the amazing ideas that come out of IYCN and are made into reality. So I'm, I'm thrilled to be here today to share a little bit about my current role, my career path, and hopefully offer some resources and advice that have shaped where I am today that, that might help you as you explore different career paths. So I thought a good place to start would be to introduce the work I'm currently doing at Cofactor Genomics because it's something I'm very proud of and that I'm very excited about. So we all have a story of how our lives have been touched by cancer, but there's also so much excitement and expectation around this area known as precision medicine. This is the idea that we can match the right patient with the right treatment at the right time. So initially this spurred incredible growth in the number of new therapies available, especially in cancer. Clinical trials for new drugs such as targeted therapies, cancer vaccines, and immunotherapies has absolutely exploded. There are now thousands of clinical trials started each year. However, our ability to find the right patients for these therapies has not evolved at the same rate. And this has created what is known as a precision medicine gap. And this precision medicine gap results from the fact that while these new therapies, such as immune checkpoint inhibitors, are transformative and provide lasting results for patients, they only work in a subset of patients. And this is the result of a more personalized approach to cancer therapy. So what's needed are technologies that are capable of playing matchmaker. So we don't treat patients with therapies that they won't respond to and may even have painful or debilitating side effects. And these technologies are called predictive diagnostics. And at Cofactor, we believe they are key to bridging this precision medicine gap. So you may already be familiar with the term molecular diagnostics. So how do predictive diagnostics specifically fit into the wider molecular diagnostics ecosystem? Well, DNA, RNA, and protein-based technologies have found utility in a number of diagnostic applications from early detection through monitoring recurrence of disease. And Cofactor is focused specifically on this central section, which is providing tools to physicians to improve their ability to predict therapy response. So when we consider the landscape of predictive diagnostics specifically, the evolution of technologies that have made an impact in clinical practice follows the path of starting simple and adding additional context over time. So in the beginning, diagnostics were focused on making predictions based on detecting cancer mutations, often generated through a large DNA panel, and then honing in on one or two key mutations to make a clinical decision. So this is shown in this bottom left quadrant. But recognizing that more signals were needed to capture the complex biology of cancer, the field of multi-analyte oncology diagnostics was born. And this is shown in the bottom right quadrant. So these companies have published on the impact they've made in cancer diagnostics by taking a multi-analyte approach. And then with the advent of the field of immune oncology, we began characterizing the tumor microenvironment to understand the role that the immune system plays in disease progression and therapy response. However, early versions of these assays still only used one or two key signals to make a treatment decision. And these are shown in the top left quadrant. And so today, we're seeing the evolution of predictive diagnostics in immune oncology with the birth of the field of predictive immune modeling. This approach builds multidimensional biomarkers rather than single analyte biomarkers, which enables improvements to predictive ability. And our company, Cofactor Genomics, are pioneering this category of diagnostics. So how does our technology work? I heard we were having a friendly competition for the most GIFs, so I thought I would use these fun animations that we have. So when a patient is diagnosed with a solid tumor cancer, the first step is often a biopsy to remove the diseased tissue, which is formal and fixed and paraffin embedded for archiving and analysis. A small portion of this FFP tissue is processed for our analysis, which starts by extracting the RNA from the tissue. 
specific reagents in our immunoprism kit prepare the RNA from sequencing, and then the sequencing data that's generated is compared to our database of health expression models, which allows us to quantify the immune components present in this patient's solid tumor sample. And then the patient may be classified as either a responder or a non-responder. In a well-designed retrospective study, we will have a cohort of patients who have been screened for specific inclusion and exclusion criteria to avoid confounding clinical variables. These patients will have been treated with a specific therapy and determined to either be non-responders or responders to the therapy. So the solid tumors of these patients is first analyzed, as I showed in the previous slide, to generate their individual immune profiles. And then our predictive immune modeling software uses all of this data collected for each patient to build a multidimensional biomarker using machine learning. And this is what accurately predicts that response to therapy. So this biomarker will then be validated in a new cohort before being launched as a predictive diagnostic. By analyzing the tumor tissue of future patients, we can provide their treating physician with a report that predicts whether the patient will be a responder or a non-responder. And because of its impact on both patients and payers, this precision medicine gap represents one of the biggest threats to healthcare, but also one of the biggest opportunities to make an impact. If we can implement a solution to this, it's a big win for the patients and their treating physicians, with many new cases of cancer diagnosed annually who are eligible for these, ther these therapies. And improving the outcomes for these patients and setting realistic expectations during their treatment plans is very important. And of course, there's a cost of treatment plans that don't work. If we can avoid giving patients therapies that they won't respond to, we save money on both the therapy and the avoided adverse events. And so eliminating the delivery of therapies to patients who won't have a response has the potential to save billions of dollars across all oncology indications, which is an economic argument that supports a large US market for cofactors uh, technology. And so to summarize the problem and our solution, precision medicine has failed us. Even with the most innovative cancer therapies, on average, only 20% of patients respond. And so what this means is that when physicians treat all patients with these therapies, as they often do in recurrent and metastatic settings, 80% of cancer patients will receive the wrong treatment that they will not respond to. And so at Cofactor, we're developing technologies that aim to cut this number in half and better match patients with the treatments that they need. Our hope is that by advancing predictive diagnostics using predictive immune modeling, we can improve these statistics so that 90% of cancer patients receive the right treatment that they will benefit from. And this is a number we would be proud of. So as I've shared, our approach is centered on the fact that our body's immune system is the most powerful defense we have against cancer and comprehensively measuring immune response at a solid tumor is essential for predicting response. I'm so grateful to be a part of this excellent leadership team at Cofactor. Um, and I wanted to now transition into how, how I specifically contribute to the work we're doing and then provide um, a little bit of information about the path that got me here. So Cofactor is a very small company. We're only about 15 people right now. So my role is very multifaceted and it's varied over time. So I currently or previously have worked on uh, defining our company's commercial strategy through category design. So predictive immune modeling is a brand new category which we developed. Um, I've overseen our technical sales team and the revenue goals for the company. I've overseen our marketing team and consultants, including graphic designers, web development, public relations. Um, I do a lot of technical writing, uh, narrative development, and slide design, like you see here. Um, I've been involved in investor relations and fundraising pitches. Um, we are a venture capital funded company. Um, I engage key opinion leaders and clinical collaborator collaborators to build relationships and secure um, biological specimens needed for our studies. Uh, I have overseen product development and product management, providing milestones and checkpoints for product development. And very recently, uh, I had the opportunity to spearhead our efforts to define um, and roll out a new mission, vision, and values internally within the company. So you can see it's, it's highly varied, uh, and there's lots of opportunities to use the creative side of science, which I really enjoy. And so how did I get here? So I initially considered chemistry because I had an interest in forensic science, um, but I wanted to start with a broader area of study so that I had more options to consider and I wouldn't put myself um, into a hole into one career path. So I earned my bachelor's of chemistry at Bradley University, which is a small liberal arts school where I was also a college cheerleader. Uh, I had an internship at the local USDA, um, United States Department of Agriculture Laboratory, um, where I had similar responsibilities to a chemical technician. Uh, my advisor at this laboratory encouraged and supported me to consider graduate school. And based on those experiences at the lab, I decided to pursue my PhD at a similarly sized institution that had great research opportunities. 
at Washington University in St. Louis, I was able to continue my involvement with cheerleading, now as a coach, and become more active in the American Chemical Society, specifically in the Younger Chemist Committee, as well as participate in a student-led biotech consulting group, which is known as the BALSA group. So all together, um, that, those experiences from bachelor's to um, graduate school, some of the key lessons I learned um, include that you really can do anything with a chemistry degree. And starting with this broad discipline um, allows you to focus your interests later versus starting to focus your interests earlier. I'm grateful that I did not pick a forensic science bachelor's degree um, because I would have been stuck down that path and never would have gotten to where I am today. Um, I also recognize that PhD scientists have more control over the direction of research projects. So if you want to be in a decision making um, capacity, you may want to consider going to graduate school. You also learn a ton of valuable skills like resilience, project management, etc. down that path as well. And these are all transferable. It's also important to balance activities with academics um, that are have nothing to do with your graduate worker or your undergraduate work. It's it's healthy and good preparation for the real world to have um, outside interests. So don't let go of your hobby, your interest in art, athletics that you pursue, or any other interest that makes you feel like a whole person. Um, along the way, who you work for matters. So finding the right mentor is perhaps the most important um, versus the institution or the career. Uh, you can start learning about the business of science as a grad student. Um, so opening and expanding your view away from the bench can start earlier. You don't have to wait for your first job to do that. Um, there are opportunities for consulting, um, for looking at um, intellectual property management at your institution, patenting your technology um, that you're working on in grad school, or sometimes even internships. Um, and finally, uh, volunteering within a professional society can make a big impact. So finding your niche, whether it's at the international level like IYCN or within your country's local chemical society, you can build a network and, and make a big impact and start to be connected within uh, uh, future career paths. So after I completed my PhD at WashU in 2013, uh, I started my career at Cofactor Genomics. And um, so while well, Cofactor was growing from a next generation sequencing contract research organization, and I was learning new technologies and new professional skills, I was still struggling to understand what my career path would look like because the company was small. Um, there was not a clear path for advancement as there are at, at much larger companies. And so when uh, the global gene editing company Horizon Discovery acquired a lab in St. Louis, Missouri, which is where Cofactor's clinical labs are based, um, I was open when a recruiter reached out to me um, to take on a customer support and later a product management role within this slightly, or slightly larger organization. Um, it's a around 200 employees at the time. But what I learned is that the grass is not always greener on the other side, and I did miss the small company atmosphere um, and my colleagues at Cofactor. And so when Cofactor approached me to return to the company as they were transitioning more into the precision med medicine space um, to take on the role of head of sales and marketing in 2016, uh, I knew it was the right move. And so uh, now I refer to this time uh, as my horizon sabbatical. Uh, the moral of the story here is always exit an opportunity gracefully. Um, you never know when your path will lead you back to an organization or reconnected with a former colleague. So when you're leaving, always think about trying to make that as smooth an exit as possible. So as you may have gathered, uh, I followed a different path than what is usually called a traditional academic path. Um, so I wanted to take a moment, revisit a topic that I wrote about in a chemical and engineering news article in 2018 when I was chair of the Younger Chemist Committee of the American Chemical Society. Um, so similar to what Gabby started our conversation with, um, I reflected on how two years after I finished my graduate training, um, I was speaking to a US News and World Report um, writer who was preparing an article highlighting how PhD trained scientists were pursuing careers outside of academia. And the article noted that at the time, only 42% of uh, people with a PhD in the sciences were working in academia. And uh, similar results in the 2015 American Chemical Society Chem Census Survey showed that the chemical workforce, um, uh, that 40.4% 40, 40 of respondents reported working in the academic sector. So. In both cases, <laughs> we're looking at the majority of scientists um, working outside of academia. And we see this um, in other representative groups, such as the Younger Chemist Committee um, and the International Younger Chemist Network, where many members are working outside of academia and away from the bench. 
So if the scientific workforce, the chemical workforce specifically, and younger members of our organizations are predominantly employed outside of academia, with many of them in non-laboratory positions, I think we need to stop referring to these career paths as non-traditional um, and just recognize that chemists can go into a variety of different career paths. But how do you find the path that's right for you, especially when most of our mentors in academia are most familiar with their own path that's taken them into academia? Well, the first step, in my opinion, is to do some soul searching. It's not just about what you enjoy, it's also about what engages and excites you, what challenges you, what motivates you, what you want your life to look like outside of work as well. Um, so there's an organization called um, 80,000 Hours, and the folks at 80,000 Hours have done some amazing research to identify what makes people fulfilled and successful at work. Uh, and they've generated some incredible resources that can help you navigate and catalog this. So you can make a matrix like the one shown here for career paths or for specific jobs that you're considering. Um, but the bottom line is to find a dream job, look for work that you're good at, work that helps others, and supportive conditions. So engaging work that lets you enter a state of flow, have supportive colleagues, um, lacks major negatives like unfair pay, and fits your personal life. And so I highly encourage you, if you haven't been to um, any of the 80,000 hours resources, to check out um, this Google Doc I have on the screen, uh, as well as some of their other resources. So um, I, I do like this cartoon. Um, because I love ice cream and uh, the idea of being an ice cream taste tester sounds amazing, but I understand that you don't necessarily want a job that is enjoyable or easy 100% of the time. You have to find that balance where you're challenged and growing, and, and I recognize this and I'm grateful for the opportunities I've found. So a few other resources I'll mention, uh, some of which require memberships to access. Uh, the American Chemical Society has many amazing career planning tools, including their Career Pathways workshops, um, as well as personal career consultants like myself. Um, both ACS and AAAS have individual development plans, which can help you navigate your career as well. And then reaching out to folks, engaging in informational interviews, um, reading about different paths online or in books like Lisa Balbus's Non-Traditional Careers for Chemists. Um, considering internships. Uh, this is an option for both undergrad and graduate students, um, although a bit more rare in the graduate student setting. Um, working with ACS career consultants or as the IYC mentorship program grows, working with those mentors and realistically trying out a, a new path that, that seems interesting to you. Your first job doesn't last forever and so um, the lessons that you'll learn in that first uh, jump into a new career path will be beneficial regardless of whether it is a permanent home for you. And so with those resources in hand, I'd like to wish each of you luck uh, and offer my support as you navigate your path to a fulfilling career. There are so many options for chemists across a wide variety of industries and, and your skills are transferable in many different ways. So don't let anyone but yourself define what success means to you. Uh, connect with me on LinkedIn, Twitter, um, shoot me an email. I'm happy to be a resource. Um, and thank you once more to IYCN for the opportunity to be a part of this series. I hope that you're all inspired to find a career path that excites and challenges you. Thank you very much, Natalie. It was a lovely presentation. I am really, it is really interesting how we should stop to call non-traditional careers and start to call like a, to, 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 stop to classify all people just around just one career path in the life, right? So exactly. we have a couple of questions here. And the first one is, uh, you commented that finding the right mentor is important. How did you identify your mentor? Do you have any advice for how to find a good mentor? Yeah, it's a great question, um, especially as you're going into graduate school, asking um, students, not only in the lab that you're considering, but also in peripheral labs, finding out what are the working hours like, um, what are the expectations of the mentor. So, so asking about the specific mentors is one facet of that. So learning about how that person operates. But then again, soul searching is important. What do you want in a mentor is also important. So do you want someone who's available 24 seven or do you want someone that lets you act? Uh, you know, act more independently. So I think it's a combination of defining what a good mentor means to you, um, and then also trying to ask the questions of people that are familiar with the options that you have and making decisions based on the overlap there. So even if it's a prolific scientist, 
if they're gone for weeks at a time, you know, presenting at conferences and they're not available to provide you guidance on your research, you may not feel fulfilled in that setting, even though it's a great opportunity. So I think it's, it's a combination of deciding what's important to you and then trying to seek out that information from people that are familiar with that person. Thank you very much. And we have a second question. Uh, do you think people with a chemistry degree are more prepared to enter pharmaceutical studies in comparison to people that already studied marketing? Ah, good question. Yeah, I think um, I, I think so. I think that chemists um, have such an interesting skill set uh, in terms of you know taking technical information, digesting it quickly, being able to remember it and speak to it. So um, someone in a marketing degree may understand the basics of marketing, but a lot of that is just human interaction. And so if you are, you understand the science well and can communicate that effectively, and you have good interpersonal skills, I think you have an advantage over someone who just comes perhaps with the interpersonal training. So yes, I think that chemists are much more prepared to be in a role like pharmaceutical sales or technical marketing when that, that technical background. Yes, and a third question is, which skills are worth including on your CV if you are looking for a similar role in the market development? Ah, yes, good question. So um, leadership uh, experience, anything that demonstrates that you have good interpersonal skills, that you like to take on challenges, that you communicate well, uh, that you have experience in a business setting, um, and that can even be just understanding how your graduate work applies you know, in the, the bigger picture of the world, um, you know, outside of the laboratory, how would this chemistry be used? So anything that speaks to that is important. Um, anything that you can quantify. Um, so everything in business is about quantifiable impact. And so even if you don't have any business experience, if you can quantify the work that you did in your graduate work. So if you increased yield, if you um, decreased waste, you know, something that is quantifiable, that translates to a business setting, you should include that. Um, but those interpersonal skills, those leadership skills, those you definitely want on there, even though they're not necessarily hard technical skills. Thank you very much, Natalie. Sure. And now I am happy to present our next speaker, Fernando Gomoyon Bell. Fernando did his PhD in organic chemistry at the University of Zaragoza in Spain. He worked as an intern science writer at Chemistry World and then as a science communicator at the Institute of Chemical Research of Catalonia in Tarragona. Now Fernando is the press and communication coordinator for the Graphene flagship, one of the biggest European Union funded projects and also collaborates with Chemistry World, Chemical Engineering News, IUPAC and others. And now I'm going to hand it over to Fernando to start with his presentation. Thank you so much for this very kind introduction, uh, Gabby. Uh, you can confirm if you can see my slides now. Okay, I'm going to see you do see my slides. <laughs> so uh, thank you again uh, for inviting me to be here. Um, I'm here to talk about the career path of a chemist in the world of science communication. I'm going to try to give you some advice and some tips to pursue this career. First, I want to thank uh, everybody again, uh, everybody at IYCN and IUPAC for organizing this wonderful series of, of webinars that is Chem Voices. And of course, thank you for inviting me, especially Laurie and, and Gabby. It's, it's been great to, to participate in this in this great series. And also, I want to start the talk with some good news, everyone that is watching, because like uh, Natalie just said, academia is actually the alternative career. Um, your PhD may be useful, unlike what you may think, and science needs communication. So science communication is a very valid career path. And again, like I said, um, I'm going to share some tips and tricks on how to become a science communicator and how you can pursue that uh, particular path in your career if you're interested in doing so. First off, uh, like Natalie said, academia is not mainstream. Uh, I could cite any other paper or book about this, but I think that Natalie's is actually the best out there. You've got the link there if you want to check it out. 
very, very few people uh, with a postdoc in the Younger Chemist Committee at ACS uh, ends up working in, in academia, actually. Most of the people, the blue part of the pie chart, uh, end up in different career paths, like uh, the ones we're highlighting here today. Uh, your PhD, like I said before, is surprisingly useful because all the skills you acquire during your PhD are sought by employers beyond academia, by employers in industry, by employers in, in companies, in startups, uh, by employers that want science communicators, and that's my cat. Um, anyhow, <laughs> you, you learn how to be incredibly resilient, uh, you learn how to be hardworking, motivated, um, and then a PhD is the best you know, the best way of getting trained in scientific thinking, which is very, very useful in a diverse range of, of careers. And then again, science needs communication. Uh, you know, the New England Journal of Medicine has the probably highest impact factors in, among journals, among scientific journals out there. It's higher than Nature, than Science, than Lancet. However, even if you publish in there, nobody actually reads that unless you communicate about it. Uh, when a New England Journal of Medicine paper is covered in the New York Times, for example, it's proven that it receives up to 73% more citations than a paper that is not covered in a mainstream publication, such as the New York Times. Um, papers that are shared uh, on social media get more citations, and now uh, every time grants in the EU and China require communication actions and plans, for your research grants and for your application. So communication is important and science and scientists need communication. So it's a great career path to pursue because it's gonna be needed more and more. Okay, great. So I've been talking for a while. I've been giving you some figures you probably don't care about. You want to learn the tips on how to become a science communicator, how to pursue this career. First off, what exactly is science communication? Again, you can find many definitions online and in books. Uh, to me, it's basically making what is really complicated and convoluted really simple. And also finding nice ways to tell stories that people are excited to hear. For example, if you find a paper that's called Nanostructuring Unlocks High Performance of Platinum Single Atom Catalysts, probably you don't want to read that. However, uh, a science communicator can transform that into a nice headline, like, you know, platinum makes PVC production greener and cheaper, and a nice story that people actually enjoy to read. So for me, science communication is finding the way to tell nice stories about science. And believe me, every paper, every piece of research, every company, every startup has a nice story to tell. So communication is, is a way to tell that story to the world. And, and it's really exciting to try to dissect the uh, papers, the research, the patents, and then go and publish that as a story in, in a mainstream media. Uh, even inside science communication, you've got many, 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 many career options to choose from. Um, I think Gabby mentioned at the very beginning of this webinar, you know, all these positions we're talking about, they're not only found in institutions and research institutions, you can find them in a lot of places. So if you want to be a science communicator, you can be a science journalist and maybe work for a publication. You can work for a newspaper, you can work for the radio or TV. You can also work doing what's known as PR, public relations and communications. You can work for an institution, a company, and basically being in charge of telling the world about that institution or that company. You can write press releases, you can handle their um, Twitter account, you can handle their website to make sure the public awareness about that company raises. You can work on maybe outreach and public engagement. Uh, that is, you know, making science available to everybody. You can do experiments for kids, you can design experiments for kids, uh, you can work on TV and maybe having a morning show that teaches teenagers about science. Uh, that's public engagement and getting people excited about science. You can even be a science influencer and have a TikTok account or a YouTube channel and talk about science there. And last but not least, you can use your uh, communication uh, skills to work in science policy. And we'll hear a little bit more about that in the next talk. 
Uh, like I said before, in all these different career paths, there's so many different things to do. Um, you can write, you can do translations, you can do, I don't know, documentation for, for a TV show or a podcast, you can do illustration, infographics, on social media, you have millions of things to do that involve communication and conveying a nice story about science for, for the public. Uh, I, I don't know, you can even do podcasts. I'm sure you can <laughs> hear a little bit about, about that later. Um, uh, and also, if you really like research, uh, there's actually people doing research on science communication. So if you don't want to leave that part out, uh, you can work on science communication and still do research on published papers on how to make communication more effective, for example. So my tip for everyone who wants to do science communication is basically go ahead, get started, uh, do something now. Um, here are some of the projects I got involved with uh, a few years back. Uh, some of them uh, were like uh, blogs or sites that helped disseminating science to the public. One was a personal project. The other one was a collaborative project that did translations of uh, science articles in English into Spanish so that more people would be able to read them. Um, and then on the left, you can see me, I don't know, maybe six years younger, um, involved in Pint of Science. Uh, it was the first time this festival was brought to Spain and what a great experience. And all this um, adds up to your, to your CV, to your resume, and actually gives you a lot of selling points to, to get hired in a science communication position. Um, you can also get trained and nowadays, um, it's really easy to get trained for free. There's videos on YouTube, um, courses on YouTube about science communication. You've got this one uh, by BBC presenter Greg Foote that is really, really good. You've got courses about uh, how to better write a story in science. Uh, this one from the University of Stanford is also free and it's really incredible. If you have the opportunity to do it and you're interested, you should definitely do it. And then of course, there's like official ways of getting trained in science communication. You've got masters, postgraduate studies, you've got internships, conferences. And again, many, many online resources that you can go uh, Google them and find a lot of information on how to get started on, on science communication and all the different career paths that, that this involves. One very, very good resource that I discovered not that long ago is the open notebook you can go to this website and you have a lot of ideas a lot of interviews that can save you as example a lot of a lot of uh, pitches which is basically the text that you send to an editor or a tv or a radio so that they can buy your story and and you know commission you to write about it to to prepare a program or something um it's it's really really good website and also they just launched a book so if you're interested, just go to theopennotebook.com and maybe get the book or explore the website. There's a lot of, of opportunities and, and a lot of training that is free in there. And then, okay, I mentioned uh, internships before, that all these places in this way offer internships very often, uh, once, some of them once a year, some of them like several times a year. Um, you can work on like magazines, uh, radio, um, you know, institutions like CERN or AAAS, it's, it's really cool and there's many opportunities out there. Uh, I leave you a link uh, to the internships in the slide and then also uh, a very good friend of mine just created this newsletter that is basically a lot of job opportunities in science communication. So if you go to that website, you can subscribe to the newsletter um, and get an email every week or so with opportunities of science communication jobs all across the world. Uh, and then just to finish in a positive way, um, I just want to like encourage everyone to like explore and learn. Like Natalie said at the beginning, no, there's no career path that is final and there's no job that is final. So if you can just, you know, go out, try to find and try to find the job you like. Um, and if you end up, you know, being stuck in a job that is miserable, try to maybe go on LinkedIn and find new opportunities and explore. There's a lot of things going out there and science communication is a really, really good 
uh, career path to follow. Uh, I mean, I'm really thrilled of being <laughs> being uh, a science communicator. So go go and check out the internet and and look for new opportunities. So that's my presentation. Uh, I think we've got like a couple of minutes for questions. If we don't have enough time, feel free to email those to me. And then if you want the slides because you want to check out the references or go to the links or anything like that, they're already online. You can get them as a PDF if you go to that link there. So you may just screenshot this and go to the link later. Uh, thank you again, Gabby and Andre for inviting me to be here and I'll be happy to answer your questions. Thank you so much. So thank you very much, Fernando. I really enjoyed your presentation. And you came up with very useful resources, right? It is very nice to know that there are many free resources for, for who wants to start in the science communication uh, career, right? But apart from that, one of the questions is, it is required to have a special certification in the area, like a, a, a special training like I, I got this specialization in science communication mm -hmm. for getting a job? Uh, I'm probably the worst person to answer this because I actually got my first jobs in science communication without any uh, qualification in, in the field. So I would say if you've got the experience and you've like volunteered, you have your own blog, your own podcast, uh, and you really want to switch uh, years and go into science communication go ahead and try and apply to that position that you like um, don't be afraid if you don't have any official training uh, but again if you do want to get the official training uh, sometimes it really does help especially to get connected to the people in the field to get connected to more like journalists people in radio people that are professionals in communication rather than science uh, and there's many many options uh, i mean here in the uk I think that probably the best is the master's at Imperial College, but there's many opportunities in the US. In, in Spain, there's like several masters already in science communication. So I'm sure that all around the world, you can find opportunities in, in this field. Thank you. Um, one additional question is, talking a bit more about your job, do you work with a multidisciplinary team that can support you areas in which a chemist in general has a little or any experience with for example in graphic design content creation for showing a chemical concept or do you have to do you need to know to know all of these skills i mean it doesn't hurt <laughs> uh, you know the more the more skills you have uh the the better of course but uh we do have a multidisciplinary team at the graphing flagship uh, like you said at the beginning it's one of the biggest projects funded by the european commission so that allows us to have a team of six or seven people so we've got people that are experts in organizing events we've got one person that is an expert in marketing we've got uh, another person that is a journalist uh, so she knows how to write super quickly and you know produce a magazine and use indesign uh, and then you know, we've got people that are science writers that come more from the science part of things. So they know they know what graphene or molybdenum disulfide mean. <laughs> but I think having a multidisciplinary team is is really key. I mean, sometimes the team says that could be smaller. Uh, I, I mean, I'm wearing like shirt from ICIQ, which was my <laughs> previous job, and in there we just uh, it was basically Laia, my colleague, who was doing outreach, and myself doing all these. PR comms and website and Twitter. So sometimes smaller teams can do great things too. But you know, if you learn a little bit about graphic design or website design, it's it's very helpful as well. Thank you very much. Thank you, Gabby. So, our next uh, speaker is Dr. Aubrey Paris. Dr. Aubrey is a science, technology, and innovation Pol policy advisor at the U.S. Department of the State. She received her PhD in chemistry and material science from Princeton University. 
and from 2015 and 2020, Dr. Party served as executive producer and co-host the ISGP's The Forum, a podcast translated hot topics in science and technology for the general public. And she has since founded a new podcast exploring niche intersections between academic disciplines and a film called National Treasure Hunt. So welcome, Aubrey. Thank you so much, Gabby. Um, can you confirm that you can see my slides all right? Uh, no, I think right now I not seeing it. Yes, yes, you're all good. Yep. You're all good. Okay. Okay. Yep. Thank you so much. Well, uh, thank you, uh, Gabby and Laurie, and to my co-panelists. Um, I'm really thrilled to be here today to kind of round out today's discussion um, and sort of represent the policy slash government side of these um, alternative careers. I think we've all agreed at this point, we're not going to call them that anymore. Um, but I am really excited to, after listening to my co-panelist presentations, I think really sum up what everyone's been saying because a lot of the things that uh, Natalie and Fernando were were mentioning, I really resonate with based on my experience. So with that, my name is Aubrey Paris and I'm a science and technology policy advisor at the US Department of State. And what I probably should have called my presentation was this, because what I think is the first important thing to realize about exploring quote unquote alternative career paths for chemists or scientists as a whole is this idea that there's no one correct way to get from lab to career. There are so many opportunities out there for you when it comes to careers and that means that the skills that you develop along the way to get there are so diverse and you should really look to that as something that's exciting and something to take advantage of. So what I'm going to do today um, in my presentation is walk through my story, my personal path, and in doing so, highlight what I think are the five key pillars of my experience that have not only influenced where I am today, but still appear in every single thing that I do in my current government job. And those pillars are my research experience, interdisciplinarity, entrepreneurship, policy, and communication. So my story begins, much like uh, Natalie mentioned, when I was in college, I was fortunate enough to go to a small liberal arts school in Pennsylvania called Ursinus College. It's about 40 minutes outside of Philadelphia, where I double majored in chemistry and biology and minored in French, because when you're in a liberal arts school, that's what you do. So there were three particular experiences or categories of experiences that I had while in college at Ursinus that really shaped where I am today. First and foremost, I began pursuing research during my first semester of my freshman year. And throughout my undergraduate experience, I was able to do lab research in biology, lab research in history, and field research in evolutionary biology. And you might say, Aubrey, those sound super disparate, very unrelated, and I would agree with you. But what happened from that experience was I began getting comfortable with and familiar with reading, writing, and communicating with different scientists that come from different disciplines, which is something that is still important to everything that I do today. Since, as I'm sure you all know, scientists really communicate in their own different languages depending on what discipline they're from. So that was experience number one. Experience number two was entrepreneurial in nature. I was fortunate enough to compete in Ursinus's first ever entrepreneurial and business plan competition in 2014. And I was also fortunate to win that competition with my team when we proposed the development of a global infectious disease reporting database. Now, this experience was particularly pivotal for me because it was the first time, thinking from an entrepreneurial lens, that I was conceptualizing how to take science or technology from a bench perspective all the way through to practice in the real world. So I was thinking about things like budgets, 
law, building a team, marketing, timelines, all sorts of things that you don't get a lot of experience thinking about when you are just doing your laboratory research. So that was pretty important for me as well. The final experience I had while I was in college that I truly credit for everything that I'm doing today in my policy work is being a fellow of the Ursinus College Parley Center for Science and the Common Good, which was an off-campus organization that selected a group of students to really dive into exploring the world at the intersection of science and society. I took ethics classes. I um, took classes on the origins of science policy, and I got to meet some really influential scientists like Peter Salk or Richard Heinzel, who had select, uh, successfully taken science outside of the lab. And all of these experiences collectively to me told me, well, I don't know what exactly I, what I want to do in the sciences right now, but I know that I want to be operating at that science and society intersection. And so I took that understanding of what I wanted with me as I went to grad school, because I knew that in order to do that successfully, I wanted to be considered an expert in a particular subdiscipline in science. So I opted to pursue my PhD in chemistry and material science from Princeton University uh, as an NSF graduate research fellow where I graduated in 2019. And this is really where my first tip of the day really comes into play. It's something that um, Natalie mentioned during her, her presentation. I think it is so important, so I'm going to underscore it here. If you are at a pivotal transition time in your personal academic career, whether you're going from undergraduate to grad school, you are in the early stages of grad school, or even going from grad school to perhaps a postdoc, you must be very um, careful and deliberate about selecting who your advisor or your PI will be. If you're someone who is considering, even considering an alternative career, especially if you're considering something like policy or government, I personally recommend being extremely upfront with your potential boss because not only then will you be able to ensure that you've selected a boss that is okay with your decision, it's kind of sad we have to think about that, but it's a reality, you can also ensure that you are selecting a boss that will be actively supportive of that decision. And that can make all the dis difference when you're transitioning later on. So I used that motif when I was uh, joining the lab at Princeton. I joined uh, the electrochemistry lab of Andrew Bukarsley, and then I had to select a research topic. And since this is the chemistry audience, I figure it can't hurt to tell you a little bit about what I did in grad school. Well, the interdisciplinarity side of my life peaked through again when I was choosing a project. And for me, it was very important that I work on something that felt like it had a strong applications base. So I chose to work on electrochemical reduction of carbon dioxide, which of course is transforming CO2 into alternative products such as alcohols or hydrocarbons. Um, that application's fascination of mine made it so that I was, I was really dedicated to studying catalyst materials that could perform this transformation that seemed as close to industrially relevant as possible. So we're talking solid state materials, high efficiency, easy or cheap to synthesize, generating economically advantageous products, etc. And so what my PhD ended up looking like was something like this. This is an actual slide from my thesis defense. <laughs> it's my summary slide of my PhD work, which I really considered to fall into three categories, which are actually somewhat cyclical in nature. On the one, on the first pillar, um, I was working on catalyst discovery. So finding new catalysts that were capable of performing these advantageous chemical transformations of CO2. Second, I worked on catalyst tuning. So strategically adjusting catalyst properties or reaction conditions to improve efficiency, selectivity, or even change the product distribution we're achieving. And finally, 
very classic chemistry mechanistic evaluation so obviously this makes the whole process somewhat cyclical because if we can understand how and why um, catalysts work the way they do that can help us logically inform our discovery and tuning process so this is where um, my second tip comes into play as you might imagine i spent the vast majority of my time in graduate school in the lab it's what you do um, but the tip really comes from the fact that for as long as you have any position on an academic campus at a university and a college, you are in the unique position of being constantly surrounded by people who are passionate about and who are expert in everything you can possibly think of, especially beyond what you are an expert in and what you are passionate about. So if you've ever, ever had a curiosity about something, even if it's very different from what you do in your lab day-to-day -day life, take advantage of that opportunity and do it while you're on that university campus. And that's gonna help you even more to understand what you might want to do after you leave your undergraduate or graduate or postdoc position. So that's exactly what I did. And I had three really important experiences that contribute to my pillars of experience um, while I was in graduate school. And I'm gonna share them with you now. The first was an on-campus experience called the Princeton Energy and Climate Scholars or PEX program. And this was basically an application only uh, honor society of sorts that brought together graduate students from all different departments around the campus whose research had some intersection with energy or climate. And what I found particularly powerful about this program was that what the students did once they were collectively in a group was entirely dependent on what they were motivated to do on their own. We made up our own projects. So there were two projects that I was deeply involved in during my two years in the PEX program. The one on the left, um, we commissioned the production of a short film on the dangers associated with considering wood-based biofuel to be zero carbon energy. I also got to voice over the video, which was really fun. Um, and then on the right, I joined a, a impromptu research team uh, that was truly interdisciplinary. I was from chemistry. I joined students from biology, engineering, and politics and policy departments. And we created our own interdisciplinary research study that quantified the impacts of uh, on water security of new coal-fired power plants being constructed in Pakistan, funded by the Belt and Road Initiative. We were able to publish this research in the journal Energy Policy and actually publish, along with our study results, policy recommendations that went along with it. And so this is really music to my interdisciplinary ears, being able to conduct something so interdisciplinary and actually publish it. My other two um, experiences during graduate school were off campus in nature. The first was part-time employment with a science policy think tank called the Institute on Science for Global Policy, or ISGP. And this was a particularly important experience because, number one, it lasted for more than six years. I started actually an undergraduate. And number two, because it was my first foray into truly understanding the domestic and international policy implications of various science and technology topics. So this was my opportunity to work on topics ranging from food safety and security, to infectious disease, to climate, to artificial intelligence, to synthetic biology, and the list goes on and on. Um, I also was fortunate through this position to be able to travel around the country moderating debates on science policy topics and leading consensus building and policy recommendation writing sessions for subject matter experts and other stakeholders in these diverse science and society topics. This is where my next tip comes into play. If you think that you even might be interested in a career in science policy or science and government, I highly recommend not, you don't have to study these topics formally in an academic setting, but get your feet wet by reading articles and exploring resources that exist online or in multimedia or podcasts, et cetera, that can let you start understanding what these science policy interface topics actually look like and what they are. Because if I say something to you like, well, science policy includes food safety, you might think, Oh yeah, we want to prevent a salmonella outbreak. 
Well, yes, but it's so much more than that. It's also deciding what regulations exist for food biotechnologies. It's determining what sorts of labels need to go on foods legally and in order to benefit the public. There's so much more that goes into these topics and you're going to have no idea which ones actually interest you beyond surface level interpretations unless you start reading about them in advance. And that's really going to help you if you want to transition into a science policy career later on. The third and final experience I had during graduate school was perhaps the most influential for me. And this is one that really harkens back to what Fernando was saying just before. I uh, was fortunate enough to have a really impactful science communication experience. In 2015, I founded with two co-hosts a science and society podcast called The Forum, um, which was on air for five years. And through that podcast, we specialized in translating hot topics in science and technology for non-scientific audiences. And our key here was we really tried to use pop culture analogies and metaphors and stories to help make those scientific topics come to life and make sense. Now, this was important for me because I did not have science communication training at all during my undergraduate or graduate career. And that's something that I think is really a shame, but an experience like this one allowed me to play with techniques and learn how to do the job as I was doing it. It was so much fun. We ended up producing more than 100 podcast episodes and even expanded our content to include uh, virtual conferences before they were cool. Um, internships for high school and college students wanting to learn techniques in science communication and the development of resources for educators at the middle and high school level who wanted to use our podcasts in the classroom. Great for a virtual learning environment, I might add. But this was a, a really important experience because I became really excited about talking about science. And so it was all these experiences collectively in undergraduate and graduate school, these five pillars of experience um, that really made me realize that science cannot operate in a silo. It interacts and interfaces with the public, with policy, with the regulatory sphere, with law, intellectual property, you name it. All aspects of society are directly impacted by science, which means that all of these sectors of society need scientists, need chemists in their workforce. And so when I started thinking about where I would maybe play the best role given my interests, I was really fascinated by the policy and government side of things. So um, the reason I came to that conclusion was because I, I took a look at all the different topics that I was discussing in my podcast, in my virtual conferences, in my PEX experience, even in my research. I'm just listen, listing a handful of examples on the screen. I was absolutely astounded by how many science and technology topics exist in the world whose societal use for good or for bad will be entirely guided by decisions made domestically and internationally by policymakers. And so that was it. I was sold. That's where I wanted to be, was in the policy or the government side of science. And so I did some research regarding some of the best ways for scientists in the United States to transition from the lab to um, this policy sphere. And I happened upon um, a series of science and technology policy fellowship programs. This ends up being one of the really effective ways for scientists, chemists included, to make this transition. Now, most of these fellowship programs, at least in the United States, are hosted by scientific professional societies, okay? So you're talking AAAS, American Chemical Society, American Physical Society, various engineering societies, et cetera. And what these programs do is they take post-PhD scientists at any stage in their career, and they place them in the federal government, whether that be an agency or Congress, for one to two year periods of work. And 
Um, I did a lot of research and found a good fit of a program for me personally, and that was through IEEE USA's Science and Technology Diplomacy Fellowship Program. And in the Q&A, if anyone has questions about choosing one of these fellowship programs, I'd be happy to go into that further. But because of IEEE USA, I landed at the U.S. Department of State which of course is the federal agency responsible for developing and implementing foreign policy, as well as conducting international diplomacy. Before I touch on what I do at the Department of State, I just want to introduce you to the agency because I know many people are unfamiliar with it. So this is the basic structure of the State Department. You'll notice it's very complicated, and that's part of the reason I wanted to show it to you here. You'll notice that, of course, the agency is run by the Secretary of State, and subsequently, it is divided into a variety of undersecretariats or families um, that all have certain themes um, under which they, they cover. And um, you'll notice that these undersecretariats and the bureaus beneath them cover just about every topic under the sun, from economy to environment to budgeting to human rights, you name it. And so the way I like to think of the State Department for folks who are less familiar is imagine taking all of the other federal agencies that exist um, in the US government and putting them all under one roof because we have one agency, the State Department, that really needs to tackle all of those topics at the international scale from an international perspective. So that's what the State Department is really doing. Now, there are some aspects of the State Department you might be familiar with, so I'll point out Consular Affairs, CA. They deal with passports and visas. International organizations here on the left uh, manages our engagement with the United Nations. And then I'll point out, of course, the Office of the Science and Technology Advisor to the Secretary or the Staff's Office, which is where I work. So the staff's office is run by an assistant secretary level position known as the science and technology advisor to the secretary of state. That position is currently held by Dr. Meng Chung. And the mission of our office is threefold, to anticipate, build, and engage. Now the anticipate pillar of our office, I like to think of it this way. We take a look at what's coming down the science and technology pipeline, and we notice a technology that will have foreign policy implications, but no one's dealing with it in the State Department right now. We pick that out and say, we're gonna start working on that topic. So that's the anticipate pillar. The build pillar ensures that the State Department as a whole has the expertise, has the personnel who can work on these topics in science, technology, and innovation. And then the engaged pillar is all of our outreach, all of our um, broad engagement with publics as well as with multilateral organizations. So that's how our office is structured. And if you talk to anyone at the State Department, actually many people within government, you'll know that their work is um, really divided into portfolios, what they're responsible for. So I personally am responsible for four portfolios. Within the Anticipate Pillar, I work with a handful of folks in the department on biotechnology policy. I also work on multilateral issues, uh, specifically related to our engagement with you, the United Nations Commission on Science and Technology for Development. And then I have two other portfolios, public diplomacy and innovation under this Engage Pillar, um, that I will go into more detail on in just a moment. But before I do that, Remember those five pillars of experience that I mentioned from undergraduate and graduate school and being a scientist? This is where they pop up in my portfolios in my daily life. So you'll see them really distributed here. Everything that I've done throughout my history, even things that really didn't seem to have a lot to do with science or even government, all are transferable skills that have a role to play literally in my daily life. So I'm gonna give you two examples of that. One of those examples is within my public diplomacy portfolio. Now, public diplomacy, along with public affairs, is our external communication with and engagement with international and domestic audiences. So for me, this involves development of a global uh, public diplomacy campaign that seeks to empower and inspire the use of science, technology, and innovation to solve societal challenges and promote public good. So this involves traveling around the world, talking to various audiences on this topic. It involves uh, writing 
Uh, I, I manage and produce a monthly article series on the State Department's website that talks about these hot topics in science and technology with broad publics and connects them to the work being done by the State Department and US government. So where do those pillars of experience come in? Well, my research helps me to assess information about these science and technology topics and know what's important and, and know what's valid. The interdisciplinary work helps me understand the values and what my audience cares about. And science communication work lets me put together the research side and the value side and effectively communicate that with my audiences. The other example I'll give is within my innovation portfolio, which is where I get to help create collaboration and public private partnerships to help communities around the country and around the world address the challenges that they face in meaningful ways. So to do this, I established a platform called the Innovation Station, um, which comprises a series of events um, that form a variety of community partnerships. So what this looks like in practice is I identify communities, say Garden State, New Jersey, um, which was where we did our pilot program earlier this summer. And I get to know that community at a deep level to understand what they struggle with, to understand what they care about. And then I get to play matchmaker and interview and chat with different innovators locally, domestically, and internationally to try to connect them with that community to help them solve their problems and create these new collaborations. And so that happens via virtual events as well as a lot of email connecting. Um, but again, where do the five pillars of experience come in? The interdisciplinarity helps me to understand and connect with the communities I'm working with. And then my entrepreneurship experience helps me to interact with the innovators to understand their goals and what they need to be considering as they create new collaborations. So these experiences that I've shared with you based on my current work and, the, and what I got to do very fortunately throughout graduate school and undergraduate, I hope it provides you with just one example of a path of how you can get from the chemistry lab to this policy or government space. And I hope that throughout this session today, for my co-panelists and myself, that you realize that all of these uh, career paths and more are possible for you. So my final piece of advice here today is to really embrace your love of interdisciplinarity and embrace your creativity. The reason I say that is because what I find is that when you, when you embrace that interdisciplinarity, you very rarely will fit within a neat box, especially when that box is a career or profession. So then what you get to do when you are creative and you are interdisciplinary is you get to create your own box tailored to your passions, your skills, and what you want to do with your life, even if that's ever changing. And that's gonna make sure that you are uniquely qualified for whatever you want to do moving into the, uh, into the future and specifically beyond the lab. And so with that, I'm just going to pop up some uh, social media contact information here on LinkedIn and on Twitter. I invite you to get in touch and I'd be happy to take some questions. Thank you very much, Harry. Your presentation was plenty of useful resources, um, particular uh, about the application for this fellowship program. Uh, regarding such programs, we have a couple of questions. And the first one is, are there opportunities for international applicants in the policy areas? Any examples you may be able to share? Yeah, that's a fantastic question. Um, there are a lot of science policy fellowships available to folks around the world these days, um, and they, they're only increasing in quantity, I'm happy to say. Um, a few years ago, I would have said, the vast majority exists really for, for folks in the United States, but that's no longer the case. Um, I'll start with the, the United States. I, I think a good resource for folks who live and are citizens here would be the AAAS website. Um, their AAAS Science and Technology Policy Fellowships, the SPPF website, uh, provides their personal fellowship as well as a list of gosh, I wanna say upwards of 30 different partner societies. So they have different academic disciplines that sponsor their own uh, fellowships. And they all will land you in different locations in the government as well. 
There are also U.S. state fellowships. So in, within the 50 states, those are becoming more popular. So you can look into opportunities there. I know, for example, California has one, New Jersey has one. There are a few others. Uh, outside of the United States, it really is on a country by country basis regarding how, um, first of all, what the opportunities actually are that they're providing and where they're going to place you. Um, I recommend a Google search, uh, policy fellowships, and then the country that you're in to see what is available to you. I did do some research last night and found that there were many out there um, on a variety of continents. So um, it would be, it'd be pretty tough for me to verbatim list them all off to you, but a Google search will help you out there. Um, I will say that oftentimes, especially if you're working, seeking a fellowship in the federal government of any particular country, you typically have to be a citizen of that country. So I'll, I'll leave that there. Thank you. We have a second question. And it is, uh, do you have some advice for chemists who want to apply for these fellowship programs offered by the federal agencies? Absolutely. Wow, I'll have to pare it down and, and, and choose how much of the advice to give. So I'm sure I can spell out information forever. Um, uh, the two pieces of advice I think I would start with are, number one, choose a fellowship program that matches your personal timeline and your goals. So like I said, there's a lot to consider here, such as which policy, uh, what type of agency, or whether you want to serve in, say, a legislative role. Um, different fellowships will place you in different locations, and that will really impact your experience. Um, the other thing is their timeline. The reason I chose to operate through IEEE USA was I wanted to go to the State Department. I was interested in foreign policy and they would allow me to begin my fellowship year immediate, basically immediately after I finished my PhD. I didn't have to take a gap year. That's not the case for all of the fellowship programs. So making sure that the program you're applying to matches your goals and your timeline. And then once you're actually doing the application, um, I think this is going to echo what my co-panelists said for their fields, but it's very true to be able to highlight the skills that you have, even if they don't seem logical connections, right? So any of those transferable skills from your outside of the lab experiences or from inside of the lab, you don't have to have started a podcast and volunteered with a think tank to get one of these fellowships. But what you do want to say is even if you spent all of your time in the lab, well, I mentored an undergraduate, and so therefore I learned these three things about working with a team or about managing people. Or I was in charge of this piece of equipment in the lab, and so that's what I, I learned XYZ about organization and management again. Or use your external experiences that you did do science communication or an internship or what else, and tell, tell them what you learned from those experiences that would be relevant to government and to policy where the name of the game is communication and relationships. So I think those would be my recommendations. Thank you very much. Uh, right now we have two more questions. We call the general question for all the, the three speakers. Um, the first one, it's, uh, it seems like the first job outside of the traditional realm is the most difficult position to land. Uh, how did you find your first opportunity and make yourself an ideal candidate for a product management position or a science communication position when you have a chemistry background? Yeah, if you don't mind, I can start with that one. Uh, so I, mostly because it's a funny story, I actually found my first position at Cofactor on Craigslist, um, which if you're not familiar is a... <laughs> Uh, you know, a posting site for people to post apartments or um, uh, free stuff, uh, but they also have a science and biotech uh, job posting section. And so um, for small companies that don't have a big budget for hiring, they often will post opportunities on places like this uh, or personal connections on LinkedIn. So um, when I'm talking to folks who are trying to make this transition, um, yes, your, your um, search is a little bit more different than someone who's looking to start in the laboratory. The, the time that you have to spend thinking about um, what your options are and how to um, 
you know, uh, sculpt your resume to be attractive is different than just taking, you know, your lab experiences and, and putting them onto a piece of paper. Um, so there, there are some tips and tricks for that. And um, I think any one, of, any one of us would be happy to talk to you about that. But look in very, uh, we'll use the word non-traditional here, non-traditional places for these opportunities, um, Craigslist included. <laughs> I think, I mean, everybody has said that already, but like list on your CV, everything that you've done. Like sometimes for like science communication career, uh, you may have written the papers in your lab. Uh, you know, there's some left where the supervisor writes a paper, there's some left with actually the students who do. So if you've done that, it's a lot of work and you have to highlight that. Also, I mean, in my, my case, I didn't know I wanted to pursue that career, but you know, I guess like everybody else in this panel, if you start doing some sort of activities that may be, you know, easily transferred to other fields, like, uh, I mean, both Aubrey and Natalie were part of the ACS. Uh, I was part of the EYCN. All those activities, list them in your CV. Because if you've done, I don't know, a newsletter, it could be relatable to doing a press release. If you've done Twitter, for yourself and you've got X followers, it may be interesting for people to know that you can handle Twitter um, and maybe you're a good fit for the communications position. It's almost everything you wouldn't think of. And like Natalie said, just look for positions like everywhere. Like some of these science communication positions are advertised on like dark Facebook groups nobody hears about. So it's probably a good idea to keep an eye everywhere and also let your friends know that you're looking for a position and again like not only just all of us are here and happy to connect on LinkedIn or Twitter or anything and having like one starting point in that field always helps because if you know if Natalie knows I'm looking for a position in uh, you know in her company she will probably give me a ring if that happens and if I know you're looking for a position in science communication I may just send you an email with the recent ad we just posted so yeah just Keep in touch. And don't be afraid to tailor that CV for the different opportunities you're applying for. I always recommend, and I think a lot of people do this, but in case they don't, having a master version that has literally everything you've ever done. So it's like many, many, many pages long. And so when you go ahead and apply for a particular position, you take that as your template, you delete out the things that are less relevant, you change the order so that the most relevant things are at the top, um, all of that kind of stuff. It, it shows a level of care um, so that you're actually caring about the position you're applying to and not just throwing your resume at everything that exists. Um, but it's also only gonna help you uh, when, it, when the HR or the job search committee is going through the application uh, as a whole. So I think, what sorry, I just, oh, yeah. I just wanted to like, add a little, like, you know, that brings up a very good point. Like there's many places with like CV advice, career advice online. ACS has one, EYCN offers um, seminars and training skills all the time. IYCN surely does the mentorship scheme. So be, go to those because sometimes you think you have the perfect CV, but the only CV you've prepared is for like an academic, academic background. So you've got like, all your papers on the top and then you go to industry and who cares or you go to a communication position and like i don't really know what jacks means so so i think it's it's good to attend those webinars and trainings and make sure that your cover letter and cv actually are up to date and ready for that position that's a very good point aubrey thank you so we have one last question and it is what was the most surprising thing or fun fact you learned since working in science policy, communication, and marketing. <laughs> that is a big question. I'm happy to not go first so I can think about my answer. <laughs> I'm, I'm not supposed to say anything. I'm thinking right now. Like I'm, I'm, I've discovered, you know, content management systems that shouldn't be even allowed and some people i'm not gonna mention use and have their website hosted on so you know you'd be surprised to see
how many people use systems from like, I don't know, 20 years ago to have a website and make that public and, you know, host the website for the biggest project in Europe, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> Um, I can go next, give Aubrey another couple of minutes to think. Um, I think for me, it's uh, I started making the transition away from the bench and felt like a huge imposter. I felt like, you know, I didn't have a business background. And so I was learning things on the fly. Um, and I thought I would never get to the point where I felt like an expert or I felt confident in my decision making ability in a business setting. And um, now, you know, being just uh, around, I guess, seven years, I don't know if I want to admit that, but just around seven years out of grad school um, <laughs> and having you know, a number of experiences under my belt, I have a confidence in my, my business acumen and my decision-making abilities. And I didn't know when that would come or if it would come without having to get an MBA. And so you know, a lot of folks ask like, you need to get an MBA if you want to go into business. The, the answer is it depends on what you want to accomplish and what your role, um, your ideal role is that you want. But I, I am, I guess it was surprising to me that this came as quickly as it did. So have confidence here in your ability to learn. You know, part of uh, uh, graduate training is picking up information very quickly. And so if you feel like an imposter, know that that will pass um, and and you will learn what you need to learn. That's a really, really great point. Um, my, mine would be like a fact meets advice. And, and that is, um, and I'm not sure how much this applies to all of the other alternative career paths that we're talking about today, which Natalie, I'm so on board with stopping calling them that so much. Um, and that is the fact that in government, in the policy sphere as a whole, the way you are ranked in the agency system really has so much less to do with your academic degree and more to do with your experience. And so um, that's not necessarily a good thing or a bad thing. It's just the reality that I think a lot of people leaving academia don't necessarily think about, right? Because you're in an academic setting, there's the, the PI, the full professor, then the different levels of associate and assistant professors, and then there's the postdocs, and then there's the, the graduate student, the undergrad, uh, and then the summer student, right? Like there's a, there's a hierarchy that's very based on your degree. Um, and when you get into government, you could be a PhD who has been a full professor for 20 years, and if you're coming into government for the first time, you are not more important than a lot of the people in the system. What really matters in government and policy is your experience in that system and how many years you've been in that agency or you know, the office, um, what you've participated in for the country in this case, like for the United States. And so I'm, I have a PhD, a couple of other folks in my office do as well, but we are, there are people above us who, you know, have, have never gone to graduate school, right? And that's something that you have to be comfortable with. Um, that's something that I think people need to, to realize that if you're trying to make one of these career switches, um, your, your past is important, but it doesn't define you anymore. And so for that, the, the advice that goes along with it is to be humble. Um, and I think humble is something that can apply to any career field. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Natalie, Fernando, and Aubrey. Did we, did, that was a fantastic discussion today. So I am very happy and I am sure our participants really enjoyed this conversation. Now I would like to invite Lori. She has some final announcement. Thank you very much. Hi everyone, I am back. Thank you so much uh, for today, uh, for this webinar. This has been um, fantastic. Gabby, I don't know if you have that slide handy by any chance. Perfect. He's here. Uh, so, I would really encourage you all to jump onto the Chem Voices website. Uh, this webinar will be made available uh, for you to stream and rewatch. Uh, you can go for all of the resources. We will make sure that we get a list from everyone to uh, make that easier for you all as well. 
Uh, we did just want to give you a quick uh, sort of save the date. Uh, the Global Women's Breakfast, which is actually a project run by IUPAC, uh, the date for the next iteration uh, has actually just been decided and announced. Uh, so February 9, 2021, uh, put it in your calendars now. Uh, you can check out the website iupac.org forward slash global hyphen women's hyphen breakfast forward slash uh, where we will be talking about the theme for the uh, for the breakfast as well as uh, putting up some material for you all to uh, use on the day. So that is this webinar over. Thank you again to all of our panelists. Aubrey, Natalie, Fernando, and Gabby for moderating today. This has been a really excellent webinar. Uh, thank you all for being with us, and we hope that you enjoy your weekend. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you so everyone. Much, Have a nice weekend. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.